Why we randomize. There's a good chance that you've heard a lot about chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine this week. It's usually taken to prevent malaria. This week, however, interest in the drug got a pretty big boost when the U.S. president suggested it could be a game changer for COVID-19. His excitement was based on this study, which concluded that hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin should be used by patients to cure their infection and to limit the transmission of the virus. The research was led by this French scientist, who has continued to strongly advocate for the drug's use in COVID-19. However, the study was not without limitations, which have now been highlighted by numerous scientists. The biggest of these limitations was that the study wasn't randomized. However, this critique has now kicked off vigorous debates about the value of randomization in clinical research, especially among people that don't know anything about clinical research. So why do we randomize? Let's say that there's an obscure Canadian celebrity and they aren't feeling very well. So they take some medicine. Then we wait and see what happens. It looks like they got better, but was it because of the medicine? To be completely certain, we would need to go back in time, right back to the exact point where we gave them the medicine last time. But now we'll do nothing. Now let's wait again and see what happens. Look, he didn't get better this time. So did the medicine work? Apparently it did. In the scenario where he got the medicine, he got better. But in the other scenario, where everything was exactly the same, except for the fact there was no medicine, he didn't get better. Of course, we might have seen that he did get better in the second scenario, even when he didn't get the medicine. In that case, we would have to conclude that the medicine didn't work. The reality is that sometimes people get better no matter what we do, but if we're not careful, we might fool ourselves into thinking it was because of the medicine. Of course, we can't actually rewind time like this to make these kind of counterfactual comparisons. Instead, we have to try to simulate them using experiments, where we try to make everything exactly the same except for the presence or absence of the medical treatment we are testing. So what if we did an experiment in two obscure Canadian celebrities that didn't feel well, and we give one the medicine, but not the other? Now, instead of rewinding time, we just compare our two celebrities at the end of the study, which is actually possible. And look, the one who got the medicine got better. But does that mean the medicine worked? Of course not. There's still two different people with different risks. In other words, there will be lots of things about them that are different, not just whether they got the medicine or not. So comparing the outcomes between them doesn't really help us. So what happens if we use groups of people and we give the medicine to one group, but not the other? And then we find the outcomes in the group that got the medicine were better than in the group that didn't. Once again, we can ask, did the medicine work? Unfortunately, just like our two obscure Canadian celebrities, our two groups might not be very comparable. For example, one group might have had all the high-risk people, indicated here by the white dots, and the other group might have had most of the low-risk people, illustrated by the darker colors. There are lots of ways for this to happen in clinical studies. For example, when we compare outcomes between groups that are recruited in different places, or when we only give medicine to the sickest people we think need it the most. Or maybe we give the medicine to the healthier people, if we don't know how strong the side effects are. So what's the best way to make comparable groups? The answer to this is to treat everyone in the study like they were in one group. And then, as they enter the study, we use random chance to divide them into groups. This helps us avoid any biases that might put high-risk patients into one group disproportionately. And if we do this properly, then on average, the low and high-risk patients will be spread proportionately across the groups. Of course, I don't actually know who is low or high risk. I might be able to use other information about the patients to venture an educated guess about their baseline risk and then create comparable groups, but that's usually very difficult and always relies on untestable assumptions. The real value of randomization is that I can create comparable groups even when I can't predict baseline risk and without those assumptions. That means randomization is especially useful in situations where our understanding of a disease is limited. Of course, it's possible to get unlucky with randomization and still wind up with groups that aren't very comparable without even knowing it. After all, flipping five heads in a row is unlikely, 
but it's still completely plausible. But flipping this many heads in a row isn't. And that's why large randomized studies can tell us so much more than small ones. So as the sample size grows, the chance the two groups won't be comparable, given that I've properly randomized, gets smaller and smaller. And thus, if we give one of these groups the medicine, and we still see a difference in outcomes, we can be almost certain that the medicine worked. I hope it's now more clear why the statisticians concluded what they did. If we're going to make strong recommendations, then we need strong evidence. And the best way to get that in most situations is with randomized trials. This, of course, is especially true if there are potential harms, either to individuals or society at large. And if you still find yourself asking, what's the big deal? Why don't they just give this medicine to everyone? Please know that there are plenty of people out there that will kindly explain it to you. Thank you for listening.